It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 78, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Connor Crickmore grosses a little over $350,000 on just over one and a half acres in Claryville, New York, with his wife, Kate. Marketing through farmer's markets and restaurant sales, Never Sink Farm has developed a reputation for meticulous, thoughtful, and simple production. Connor shares the history of Never Sink Farm, including how he simplified production and marketing, increased his income, all at the same time. We discuss how he and Kate found the time to make decisions and improvements in the hectic and critical early years and the whys behind the choices and investments they made. We dig into the details of NeverSync's no tractor production system, why they've eschewed tillage, plastic, and more. Connor tells us about the details about how they made everything from weed control and irrigation to harvest and washing the produce easier and how they relay that information to their employees. I love Connor's approach to the management process at Never Sink Farm, and I really appreciate how much he goes into the details and the background in this episode. Enjoy. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. Connor Crickmore, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hey, man. How you doing? Doing great. So glad that you could make time to join us today. You mentioned that um, here it is on a on a Monday morning and we're recording. You mentioned that your farm is closed today. Yeah, we're normally closed every Sunday and we're going to try to start to be closed Monday as well. Take more time off. Love that. I love to hear that. So, Connor, can we can we start off by having you give us the, the lay of the land there at Never Sink Farm? I think a lot of people have, have heard bits and pieces about about your operation. I think it'd be kind of nice for you to give us a, a well-rounded picture, if you could. Okay, it's um, it's one and a half acres in production. It's vegetables and herbs. We do a lot of indoor growing as well. We have two movable houses, three big stationary houses, and uh, a tunnel. We have no tractor, and that includes uh, two-wheel tractors. We have a two-wheel tractor, but we don't use it in the field. Um, and so it's no-till, permanent bed system, um, no plastic mulch. Um, I know there's a lot of no's, but it's because we've really stripped it down and made it as simple and easy for me as possible. Um, and that's the system. We grow year-round. Obviously not year-round outside, year-round in those high tunnels. Yes. We we grow really deep into the season because we don't cover crops. So we'll grow as far as we can into the season. And if it freezes out, we we just leave it to freeze in the field and then pull it out in the spring. So one and a half acres, how much are you guys making off of that? Well, as of yesterday, we produced 368,000 over the last 12 months, one and a half acres. To be exact, it's 1.58 acres. And we feel we can do well over 400, maybe over 450 without more land if our production continues in its current trend. This is partly due to us always setting a high production goal for ourselves. But we recently took a little trip and met with other farmers in Vermont. And so we kind of decided to stop putting immense pressure on ourselves to keep production growing and growing and growing. And we're starting to feel really good about where production is and uh the rate of growth. And so we're going to try to keep the pressure off of us and, and maybe spend some more time vacationing. I think it's really smart. I mean, with that intensity of production, you guys are obviously working hard and, and pushing the limits of what you guys can do on that land. I don't, these aren't numbers that we hear about very often. Yeah. And I, you know, we just, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to do those numbers. And it's not until you kind of look uh, look around that you realize you're, you're doing okay because you always feel like you're not, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> you know, I look out on a field and people see no weeds and I see all the weeds. I, I remember that very well. And, and of course, <laughs> I, I mean, I still, I still have that, you know, I, I run into that every day and I'm not even farming anymore. So to be making that kind of money, where are you guys selling your produce? Well, we've stripped it down to two outlets 
at this point, which is we do farmer's market and direct to chef. Uh, we used to do a little bit of a CSA. We did an on-farm store. You know, we did a lot of different stuff. And we found it was just much more efficient to really focus on a couple of channels. And so that's where everything goes now. Are those farmers markets and restaurants, is that in and around Clearyville where you're located or is that, are you taking that someplace else? Well, the farmers markets are down south of us and they're down in Westchester County, which is where I grew up. We used to do farmers markets locally, but we continue to outgrow them. And so instead of adding more and more farmers markets, we just work on getting bigger and better farmers markets. And we kind of landed in Westchester because those are the customers I know because that's where I grew up. To know my customers really well was important, and it really helped us on the marketing end. The restaurants are all in New York City, and we put our stuff on another farmer's truck who does farmer's markets in the city. And then he unloads it to a smaller delivery company, which delivers it direct to the restaurant. And that's worked out really great for us because we don't need to take time away from the farm and drive to the city. How far away are you guys located from New York City? Two and a half hours. So getting down there and doing those deliveries, I mean, that's that's the day a week that you guys are trying to take now on Monday right there. (laughs) Yeah, well, we actually never did the delivery. We had a lot of demand from the city, but we just never wanted to do it. And it wasn't until we were able to put it on the other farmer's truck that we decided to go ahead with it. And that really helps us sort of narrow down our marketing and uh, make it more efficient. So it's a great thing that happened. That happened about three years ago. And how long have you guys been there at Never Sink Farm? It's been five years. So this is our sixth season. It's been a very quick ramp up. We came here uh, from the city. We were living in Brooklyn. And the plan was to do a homestead. And I, there wasn't really much of a plan at that point. <laughs> but <laughs> we wanted to get out of the city. The city was great when we were young. It was lots of great food, going out. And then after marriage, and you're in a very expensive apartment and not going out very much anymore. So we decided to move up here where I had a uh, fishing cabin and the property down the road became, we, well, we were looking at the property down the road and we made a, put together a project for the owners to lease it. And they went, they said, yes. And so we grew the farm off of that and we had $30,000 and that was the beginning investment, no other job. So we just put our heads down, work, and now in our sixth season, we are buying the farm. So we grew it off the proceeds of the farm, and now we're able to buy it. When you guys started farming then, you didn't have kids? No, we didn't have kids. Uh, It was just Kate and I. So the first two years, I think it would have been difficult, because the first two years were very hard. Because uh, we, we we had no experience farming. We, I, I hadn't been to another vegetable farm until about three years ago. That would have been very, very difficult. So the kids are three. So we've had them the last, you know, for the last three years. And you guys had twins, right? Yeah, lucky us. You know, having twins, it, it's like having four kids, you know, because they, you know, they get each other into trouble. Yeah, I had a I had a friend who had twins when I was farming, and I I always just used to look at her world living in town, and I just go like, you know, thank thank goodness that, that didn't happen to us, because you know the for us the third kid just about pushed us over the edge, um, <laughs> and that happened in our, our second year of farming, not very well planned, uh, second yeah. year of farming on our own, and and it was. I mean, what a challenge, and especially in a in a in an operation that's growing, which it sounds like yours has been a rapidly growing operation. Yeah, it was. It, it grew really fast for a couple of reasons. Looking back now, one was because it was so difficult. We wanted to streamline everything, make things as simple as possible, and so to do that, we needed to grow fast. We needed to make investments. 
And the other reason was because we were kind of shut off from farming, we had this feeling we were never going to really be good enough. So we were just pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves, trying to solve every single problem on the farm just to make the farm more productive. And so it was those two things that just caused us to grow it as fast as we could and make it functioning, you know, and maybe the kids probably pushed it too, that, you know, suddenly you have a, a bigger financial burden on your life that you have to really put more effort into the farm. And, and of course, I think kids also push you because suddenly things like quality of life become important. And of course, I imagine that you may have been working as hard, but Kate probably had to scale back on, on her involvement in the operation. Yeah, but she worked pretty damn hard. Yeah, <laughs> so she was out I don't, there I don't, like. Not I don't pregnant. want to take away any credit, you know, For but sure. I know I know what a challenge that is. You know, to, I mean, you, you have to get you have to get yeah. food on the table. You got to get diapers have to be changed, and you know, it it does cut down on the efficiency level. Yeah, absolutely. We were lucky enough to, you know, Kate's mother. She did stay with us a couple of summers to help out, and that was a just huge, you know, and, and just creating a simple farm was probably the best thing we could have done to be able to do it. Because, you know, we used to work sun up to sun down, and now the farm opens at 8, and we try to get out of here before 5. Wow. Those are impressive farming hours. Yeah, I and mean, it just worked hard to try to achieve that. It was It, it was very important for us. And, you know, we, we've made a decision now to not expand further and continue to streamline what we have. Because we really thought we'd have to move to four or five acres to earn enough money. And that never happened. The production just kept going up and we had to focus on infrastructure rather than expanding uh, acreage. I want to get into some of the technical details of of how you do your farming, um, and I know that that that's that's what you're really known for out in the community. But but as we're talking here, I'm I'm kind of fascinated by this idea of you know you guys said you 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 dug in and you just started you had to solve every problem on the farm and you figured things out and you streamlined which is actually the opposite of what most people do when they start their farms most people pile on enterprises and then try to you know keep those all chugging along i'm really curious how you guys went about your decision making process and and that problem solving process when you came into the farm with no experience and and a very limited capital budget well, the way we approached it was at the beginning, it's very chaotic. You know, we had some chickens at the beginning. We had pigs at the beginning. We were killing with uh, BCS. And we were able to make really quick decisions if something wasn't working. And it's not just because it wasn't working in general. It may just not be working for us. And so we would cut it out pretty quickly. Um so the chickens disappeared, the pigs disappeared. We focused more on maybe some hoop house growing. At, you know, when the tiller became a pain, we just got rid of it and decided we didn't need it anymore. And some of this may be due to the background I had. I was a data architect, and my job was to build these gigabyte, terabyte systems of data that needed to function very, very quickly. So you would always be looking for bottlenecks in the system, uh, you know, where to improve it. And it's very important to look for the narrowest one, not just any bottleneck. So that's sort of how I approached it. I looked at anywhere where we were squeezing our system. And that could be anything. And it could be a cheap fix. It could be just a change in how we do it. It can be an expensive fix. And we were not afraid of expensive fixes. We were also not afraid of throwing things out completely, even if we had made a big investment in them, and sit down and figure out, will this pay for itself? Um, so we've changed every system on our farm almost on a daily basis. We didn't make a decision, we're not going to till. It just was a natural process. We don't need this pillar anymore. It's just wasting our time, and it's not helping us. 
It's bringing up weeds. We have to keep lining up the beds. Now we have all the beds staked. They're all permanent. I have them all numbered so people can find them easily. I don't have to show them where to go. The irrigation is permanent. And so it was just a natural progression of changing that system constantly. And we're still doing it. I, I'm interested in some of the other decisions. I mean, you you mentioned some of the, the parameters around your decisions around tilling. And I mean, I'm interested, you know, you guys, again, got rid of the livestock. You said you had a small CSA. Where did you find when you said the narrowest bottlenecks? Um, what did what were you looking at in terms of bottlenecks? Are they financial? Is it amount of time that it takes? Is it how hard it is to train somebody? How do you determine what your narrowest bottleneck is, where you're going to focus that attention on problem solving? You know, I think that's a book right there. <laughs> it's difficult because it's all of those things. You know, in, in the example of tilling, it's not just time. It's also how quickly can you train someone to use a tiller correctly? especially if you're only telling one row and make sure they go straight. Broad fork is very easy to train. Um, so a lot of the decisions are made off, can I ramp a worker up quickly on this? Can I not? How many people can do it? Um, and also quality is important. Some, some bottlenecks are across all vegetables. Some are just one vegetable. So a bottleneck on a vegetable could be germination problems where you, need, you, know, you have to increase your water holding capacity or your irrigation or making the irrigation easier so you're actually turning it on and so the workers are turning it on. Um, or it could be just a simple thing like how you harvest your char. We used to do it leaf by leaf because it grew up back a lot faster. But, you know, our limiting factor was more time in harvesting it. So now we just cut it, bunch it, and go. It may be at the washing station. It may be an equipment thing or it may be some sort of practice we're doing at the washing station. And the more I get out of the field and was, were able to manage the farm, I could look at every single process and try to fix it. And we also include workers in that. So, you know, we ask them, which is better for you, which is more comfortable, which is, you know, a faster method that you can do faster. And so it, it, it includes all of those aspects. It's not just financial. Sometimes it's just uh, quality of life. Sometimes it's, you know, things are just a pain in the ass. And I'm not going to do them. And that's not helping anything. If I'm going to do them, then it's going to be a good thing, regardless of if it's financially better for us. So you're making all these decisions. I mean, obviously very rapidly to get to the kind of, of productivity that you've got on the small acreage that you're farming. But you're also out there doing the production work. How did you guys find time to make these decisions? Well, when you're, when you're out there doing it, um, you're probably making different decisions than if you have workers doing it. You know, I, I, can, I can bunch charge, you know, a mile a minute. And I see no reason to change the process. But once you have a worker, then you have to change the process because they're going to do it much slower. So you have to find ways of making them move faster without, you know, the stick. So the, the, the improvements we made when we were working in the field were different, but they did help eventually. But we had to throw a lot of them out and change things up very, very quickly. Uh, once we started having more and more workers. So we just did things very differently. I mean, even seasonally, we'll change it. You know, I, I, I'm not committed to any system. I'm not sure how to put it. I suppose. I mean, right there. I mean, you're not committed to any system. That's a, that's a very, uh, well, it's a, it's a, it's a very Zen perspective to come from, right? I mean, you're open to what comes your way. You know, there's, there's small things, you know, there's, 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 there's little small things which help here and there. And then there's just little golden nuggets which change everything. You know, when we threw out soil blocks and went to windstrip trays, it was a huge time saver. It was gigantic. And then when we added a germination chamber that we didn't have to cover the seeds anymore, it was 
much simpler process. People could just fill the tray, dibble the germination chamber. You know, those things just were huge. But, you know, you have to have the small things too, the little tiny changes on, on you know, putting a ramp in front of the cold room and, you know, making sure everybody's putting stuff on a hand truck and, and all of that, and having a ramp on the stand, you name it. They all add and they all, they all add up over time. Well, you you actually just mentioned one of my pet peeves, making sure that everybody's putting some putting things on a hand truck to move them around in the packing shed, you know, and, and because so many employees don't understand just what a cool invention the wheel was and and all the ways that it makes their work more efficient. When you talk about maximizing productivity and so much of that is coming in terms of labor, and it's it's clear from the examples you've given, bunching Swiss chard, uh, the changing from soil blocks to the wind strip trays, that labor is really important. How do you how do you get your workers to adopt those best practices? I make things. I try, and this is the most difficult thing I find is I try to make all the boundaries of the task as clear as possible. Um, so I'll throw things out, throw techniques out where there's gray areas. So if uh, whatever the procedure is, I want it as clear and simple as possible so that it's easy to do, it's easy to understand as best as I can do. And that's not always possible, but it's always the goal to make it simple. Sometimes workers don't like it, but it really is the only way to know that what you're doing is working. And if you need to find places to improvement, if everybody's doing something different, you don't know how to improve it. If we're doing it the same every day, you can make those small improvements and see the results. Well, we have standard procedures for cultivating, turning over beds, hand weeding, every type of harvest. So there's a task ticket that that I assign to a board where their name is. It has uh, the map of the farm with every bed number on it. Um, so they can get the bed number of where this task takes place what's in the bed so that they can make sure that the bed number matches what's in it and then it's highlighted on the map so that they can all three can match and then when they're turning over there's a list of exactly what needs to be done in order every single time exactly the same so that would be removing the vegetable matter all of it not some not the tall ones not the little one all of it forking and exactly how to fork is a, I have an employee manual on how to fork and then how to spread amendments at the end of that. Um, and so every process is at least documented or shown to them what exactly what we're looking for. So it's not just wrap it with a rubber band, it's wrap it three times with a rubber band. You know, there's a number associated to it. There's a... Uh, exact process associated to it. And that's what we find works the best, at least for us. It's really interesting because we we recently did an interview with Jack Hadeen from Featherstone Farm out in Minnesota. Jack's farming, I think it's 165 acres of vegetables, you know, doing a couple million dollars in sales a year and is was actually saying exactly the same thing for how he's assigning tasks to his employees, that it's, it really has come down to having standard operating procedures, written instructions, and that, that also creates some accountability around that as well. And I think it's interesting that, that you guys on such vastly different scales are both using essentially the same techniques for managing your employees. Yeah, everybody you know has a lot of responsibility here, and that's sometimes tough for people when they start. But everything needs to be signed off on. Who cleaned this needs to be signed off on. If you take out a radio, you got to sign it out. You know, there's someone who signs out for making sure the gates are shut at the end of the day. It all needs to be signed, and I find that they actually get done. Just those initials make all the difference. We used to lose a radio every two weeks. Since we put in the uh, 
sign out, we've never lost the radio. Amazing how that works, doesn't it? <laughs> it is. And I, I and I and just just this week I'm thinking about changing the system. I'm gonna assign one number to an employee for the season. Because I think they actually get put in the charger better if I do that. And so we're gonna try that. You know, it's just an example of always changing it to see if something else works and just making it a little bit better. Was this something that you had encountered in your in your previous life as a as a data manager, or is this a system that you put in place based on your experience on the farm? I think it's mostly based on the experience in the farm, but you never know what influences you, what what you're picking up, and what you're changing. You know, you're always taking little bits and pieces. You know, we started out, you know, looking at what Elliot Coleman was doing and trying to do a little bit modeling after that, and then we end up throwing so much of it away and changing it just because we needed to make money. So you never know what little pieces you're keeping and throwing out and adapting and changing. Um, but, you know, it, it's mostly through the experience on the farm of what's working and what's not. You know, we used to have a whiteboard and say, you know, go out to this field and there's some carrots there. They're next to the beach and, you know, just found that wasn't working, so then we numbered them, and then that wasn't working. That so we just kept changing it and changing it until we came to the task sheet, and we're actually thinking about changing those again, so that I have a task sheet where I circle whether it's cultivating or hand weeding. Now I want to have color coded ones where we have just a cultivating one, just a hand weeding one, just a turnover one, just an amendment one, and then I can have a cheat sheet on it. So that I could have information, you know, did you fork it? Did you do this? And then I could check each one so we don't, so that everything gets done. Because sometimes people will plant and not turn the water off. This way we can make sure the water gets turned on for the planting test sheet. So I just keep, you know, changing over time and changing over time just to make it easier. Because I don't want to get upset just because the water's not turned on. I'd rather figure out a way to make it turned on without getting upset with people, if that makes sense. I actually think that's as much of a quality of life thing as as limiting your work hours and and adjusting your your weekly schedule. I mean, it it really is. When things work smoothly on the farm, it's a better place for you to be as a farmer. Yeah, and you know, you have to like as I said when we first started out, we needed to fix everything. You know, we felt you know personally defeated if something didn't work. Now we kind of have this 90% rule. If 90% is working and something's not working, we consider it not our fault and we're just going to live with it. Because <laughs> it was just too much pressure. Because there's nothing, you can't be a farm where 100% works all the time. So we had to reduce that pressure on ourselves and on our workers as well. I'm actually surprised to hear that because when you're talking about pulling $350,000 off an acre and a half, it feels to me like a place where every little thing had better work. Well, for me, every it's, about time. Square, it's about square footage working, right? So I need every square foot to produce. And you're going to have things that just didn't work. But you have to move on, you have to pull it out, you have to plant something else and not stress about it. Just move on. Even if you know what the problem, how to solve the problem, because, you know, usually solving a farming issue like that takes the season. It's something you're going to change in the spring. Um, you're going to change your process a little bit. And so we just try to move on quickly and make a decision fast and move on to something else just increase production on something else. But we want to make sure every foot is working. So when we do a soil test, we do it for every 3,000 square feet, which is lots and lots of soil tests on the farm, just because I don't want 10 feet of a bed not working. But we have to be able to allow a certain percentage of things to just not work because you cannot control it all. There's just, there's no way. So you just let it you just you have to move on quickly. At least that's what I need to do. I need to pull it out, not look at it, and plant something else without you know really quickly. 
you mentioned early on in our in our conversation that you guys are not using cover crops and that you're really trying you're really working hard to extend the season out out of doors as well as indoors you know that you have stuff that that sits in the field until it freezes are you turning over most of your beds multiple times in a year yeah what we do is we plant before the end of the day so if it if it's lettuce head harvest day we'll harvest the lettuce heads the we use a lettuce knife, just uh, cut them off, take them out, and then we turn that bed over in the afternoon uh, where we don't pull the stumps out. We don't waste time with that. We just, if there's any weeds there, which hopefully there's not many weeds, uh, we amend it if it needs amending, fork it, and replant. So beds are out of production only for a few hours. That's true with beets, that's true with radishes, that's true with scallions, that's true with arugula, spinach, even peas. We just continue to continually replant, replant, replant all the time. And has that influenced your choice of crops that you're growing? Maybe. It kind of it influences our choice of what we're going to do in starts, because I really like starts, because we can put them in and uh, not waste time. Uh, it really influences how we farm because, you know, it may just be 50 feet. You know, you may just have harvested 50 feet of cilantro. You need to get in there and a tiller is going to be a waste of time. Certain techniques will be a waste of time. So it's really influenced just how we go through our process because we need to turn over beds immediately. Um, and this will be inside houses or in the field that I kind of want to have the same system for both and be able to work them the same. Crop decisions, they're more, I make the decisions about crop based on how much money they make. In. So if something's not earning a certain amount per row foot, then I either need to change the marketing on it, uh, figure out how to sell it in a different way maybe increase its production, maybe solve a problem on it. And if all of that doesn't work, I need to get rid of it. So we've gotten rid of crops that we just couldn't make work for us because it was just more important for every, every row foot to make money. And we made also, you know, when we started farming, we tried to grow really bizarre stuff. And we decided early on we were not going to try to convince people to eat things that they didn't want to eat. We want to leave that to other people and sell them the things that they really wanted. And so we just increased production on those things, like cucumbers and tomatoes, strawberries, you know, that, that always leaves the table first. But as we grew, and now that we have a little bit more time, I'm kind of putting sections aside where I can grow more interesting stuff for my own enjoyment so things don't get boring. And to, you know, kind of have a little extra weird stuff on our harvest list for the chef. But we don't go into, like, full production of purple broccoli or anything, you know. I think it's one of the really powerful things for farms that have chosen to move beyond the CSA model is that it really does give you more flexibility to focus on the crops that actually make you money. Yeah, we, we found that when we were doing the CSA, there was, a, there was a couple of problems. One was you have a lot of little tiny customers. And, you know, that's a lot of work to make them happy. So we were putting a lot of time without a lot of return because it's really a discount vegetable program. And I think that works on a certain farm. It's great. But for us, we didn't want to sell our vegetables at a discount. We were selling all of them anyway. It was time consuming to manage all of the expectations from the small clients. And we also didn't want to raise discount products. We wanted to do early tomatoes and we wanted to do, you know, trellis cucumbers. And on a CSA model, it's hard to explain to a CSA member why they're not getting, you know, our tomatoes that we're producing in May in their box because they just cost too much to grow. So we sell them at a really high price. Or whether they, they, I think they're, mostly unwilling to pay that kind of premium and it just complicates the system. So we just ended up getting away from it. When you guys decided to move away from CSA, it wasn't necessarily a financial decision. It was a, 
it was a management decision. It was a simplify. It was a, an example of something where you did the simplifying process that you discussed earlier. Yeah, it's a simplifying process. But in that, that's always a financial decision as well, because the work that we put into it isn't as it still makes money, but it doesn't make as much money as sort of narrowing our focus in other revenue streams like farmers markets and restaurants, at least for us and what our kind of our model was of uh, keeping things very high quality, working off season and kind of we're trying to work around what the big farms are doing um, and offer things when they don't have them and then kind of lower production when they do. And so it's both financial, it makes it easier, and it's just, it's more interesting for us. You keep coming back to that, more interesting for you. I mean, I think farming is interesting enough as it is, right? And you guys keep layering on challenge after challenge then. Well, I, you know, I'd like to keep it farm for me. You know, the, uh, you know, everybody's different. Everybody has to farm the way that they find enjoyment out of it. And for me, sometimes limiting myself to the same crops over and over just because those are the ones that sell and make money, you know, it's, you want to throw a little bit of something else in there just to make it more fun and more interesting. So we, we do make changes based on our interests, and we also make it on quality of life. Some things are just not faster, but they're just easier. And I, I don't mind making those changes either. And I think maybe at the end of the day that those those decisions do help financially. It's just very hard to calculate them. I just feel that maybe I I will do them if they're easier and if I enjoy them. So with that, Connor, I'd like to take a break, get a word from our sponsors, speaking of the financial side of things, and then um and then when we come back, I'd like to really dig into your your production system. Okay. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort B and Fort Light potting mixes for organic growers since 1992. Founder and owner Carl Hammer got started as an organic vegetable grower, where he learned that quality transplants really mattered and that quality transplants come from quality potting soils. Just like the donkey in their logo, Vermont Compost Company potting soils aren't glitzy, they aren't glamorous, they're steadfast and consistent, stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from just a few cubic centimeters of soil. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program can help you get what your plants need at the best price with the the best shipping options. Their full truckloads and shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that sometimes get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Plus, you pay a lower price for the potting soil. To get a quote from Vermont Compost, go to the ordering page on their website and submit the request to quote form. This form also adds you to their mailing list so you stay in the loop on the program. And remember, the donkeys that I mentioned earlier, they're the real thing. You get a little bit of donkey manure in every batch of Vermont compost potting soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need with PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheeled farm tractors. I've used other tillers and mowers, and I spent most of the time when I was using them thinking of how much easier it would be with a BCS. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought one for ourselves. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working on our high tunnels. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments. All right, and we're back with Connor Crickmore from Never Sink Farm in Claryville, New York. Now, when we were chatting over the break, you know, we, we were talking about these systems for the farm and how I wanted to, I wanted to get into discussing like what you did, you know, but, but you kind of said, well, here, why don't you take it? I think people get too hung up on, you know, maybe this one method, like everybody's moving to tillage parks and raised beds and power harrows. And 
you know, it's, it's much more important to find out what's working on your farm, making your systems better and making them more efficient and making them financially worthwhile. You know, we looked at raised beds and said, you know what? If we went to raised beds, the raised bed would have to be 35% more productive just to break even with what we're doing. So it's important, you know, we always look at it and say, you know, is, does this really make financial sense or is this just what everybody's doing? I mean, I know I'm somebody that gets excited when I look out at what, what other people are doing and I go like, oh yeah, that's, that's it. There's the answer. Yeah, I realize that you're kind of saying like, you don't necessarily have the answers, but I think, I think everybody's really interested in just exactly what you are doing and what you found that is working on your farm in your system to be able to do all of this without having a, a tractor intervention. So maybe if you could tell us how a typical production cycle might work on your farm for a given crop. Well, we could look at carrots, incredibly important crop for us. So it has to work. Uh, carrots are, they make very good money. They're, everybody loves them, uh, but they are hard to grow. So you have to have a, a good system. Um, and so the way we do them is the soil is prepared like any other crop. We fork it, uh, times all the way in every 10 inches. Um, we make sure it's cleared of all weeds to start out with. So we have a blank slate. Then I will tilt it. I, I am a huge user of the tilter. I love it. I bring it, I carry it around all over the farm. I use it all over the place. And, uh, then we will, then I will, after I tilt it, I roll it. I use a, uh, it's not the Johnny's roller. It's, it's this completely different roller. It's one I can carry around. And it's, it's not too heavy. It's uh, used in the cement industry. Um, and after I roll it, then the great thing about this system is we have stakes on every single bed. They're all stakes permanently. So I just wrap a string around those stakes, and now I have my straight line, which gives me really good efficiency. So my path is always 12 inches. It doesn't migrate over the season. You know, usually what migrates is the path gets wider. Um, this way the right. path stays where it's at. It stays 12 inches. And then I do carry 12 rows across the 30 inch bed. And then the other great thing is all of our irrigation is permanent. So it's uh, all overhead, and all, you know, at the end of the row, there'll just be a uh, hydrant. You just turn it on, which gives us great germination because I'm going to turn it on because it's easy. It's right there. I just turn it on right after I'm done. And then the following week, we do uh, once a week, we, we try to use the burner. So sometimes when we harvest radishes, we'll burn the tiny weeds under the radishes before we re-go and before we re -seed. And I'll swing that burner around and we'll do the carrot. And that'll give me, you know, a week from the time I put them in, which is just enough time. So I'll give them a nice burn. Then we'll grow them. And then the carrots, when they're harvested, they're bunched in the field, which we changed from last year because we got a bunch washer. Uh, they're all bunched in the field, brought in, and then we have a bunch washer, which we, the reason I changed it out to a different system, what, to this system, because they weren't getting cleaned enough. So with this system, anybody can make them clean. They're, they're perfectly clean really, really quickly. Uh, it may not be faster, but the product is identical every week. It's always clean. And then they go into totes, which are only used for har for packing. They're never put out in the field. We have harvest totes from packing totes. They're put in the center of the washroom. When they get four high, they get rolled into the, uh, they, they get labeled and rolled into the uh, cold room. Um, and that's the system for carrots. You said the broad fork and then the tilter. So with the broad fork, are you, you said the tines, tines go into the ground on that, and then are you just wiggling that back and forth, or are you forking that all the way back? How does, how does that work? The workers are instructed that they have to go all the way in until, you know, you hit the base of the broad fork, and then you pull it back until it cracks, because all soil is different across the farm, right? Some you have to pull back really far before it cracks. Some will crack pretty quickly, and this I do because I don't want it we bring up wheat seeds where it's pulled all the way up and the soil slipped over 
or where it's just a little bit and it's just not really doing much. So the cracking we found was a good point at which to stop pulling it back. And then the tilter gives you the seed bed that you need for doing a, a direct seeded crop like carrots. Yeah, and we, we started off with very rocky soil, but we removed every single rock. And we anytime we find a rock, it has to come out. The rule, no matter what you're doing, if you see a rock, you take it. Because um, the tilter doesn't work very well with any rocks or anything. Yeah, so we tilt it nice and smooth and then roll it, and it gives you a really nice seed bed to start out with. Okay. And then how are you doing the seeding with a crop like carrots? I use the uh, four-row pinpoint seeder. Um, the, we experimented with the six-row, but it was just too... It was too hard to make sure that it was working all the time. Um, so now we have a lot of the pinpoint seeders, which are dedicated, some dedicated to pelleted, some dedicated to fine. We keep them in different places on the farm, so they're handy. Um, so we really like it. They're, they're cheap. You can have a whole bunch of them. And then are you rolling the bed after you seed with that pinpoint seeder then? To, to pack in those seeds? Yeah, I will roll it right afterwards. I'll roll it with that cement roller again. Um, it's expanded metal like the tiny ones, but it's two smaller rollers. Um, really easy to get in and out of a, a hoop house, get it around the field. So I'll just roll it again, make sure that it's uh, seeds are covered, and then immediately water from overhead. You tell us about that irrigation system. You said you're watering from overhead. You don't have sprinklers that are just one bed wide or anything, do you? No. What, what, what I did was, you know, we started off with no water here. There, there was nothing on the farm. We had to bring a uh, you know, gravity system in, and it was uh, a nightmare. We used drip, which I absolutely despise, and... We had to find something else. So after we put in our well and we had pressure, I went to sprinkler stand. And sometimes when I move to a different system, like let's say the windstrip tray, I'll buy every single tray on the market first. Ten of these, ten of that, ten of that. And I did the same thing with the sprinkler heads and the stands. It may sound expensive, but for me, it's less expensive than committing to one thing that you don't like. So we found stands and sprinklers and different systems, and we settled on a this certain stand and sprinkler head, which has the exact distance to cover what we call a section on our farm. Every section is numbered. It has eight rows, and it's 100 feet long. And so you can have four stands with a sprinkler head, and then we had to you know, plumb them so that you can have them in a line. They just use regular garden hoses. Use a little bit higher quality because we leave them out in the field permanently. And then they're connected to hydrants, which we put around the whole field so that each section or two sections can be connected to a single hydrant. And this way, we just turn it on when we're done. We don't have to drag any hoses. It's It's been uh, a real time saver. I, I don't even think about them anymore. They're just so much a part of the farm, at least outdoors. We, we do different watering inside, but outdoors that we, we use exclusively. I think that's so important, that idea of making it so easy that you that it's not a question. I know that on my farm and on a lot of farms, you know, irrigation was a question for us always. It was like, okay, I got, I got the seeding in. Do I need to irrigate? Is it going to rain? Absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So just, I, I love that you just made that dead, uh, a dead simple decision. I'm just, I'm going to irrigate. Well, we, we, we flattened out this new area next to one of our hoop houses that we were going to put a new house, hoop house on. It doesn't have a hydrant. It has the sprinklers. All I need to do is unscrew another set and screw this one on. And the watering in that section is reduced probably by 40% because of that little thing that needs to be done. You know, that, those little, so just making it a little bit harder changes my practice. That's why I got to make it simple. You're really talking about easing up on yourself in a lot of ways and, and almost lowering 
your expectations for how you're going to perform. I, I, I agree with you. I, 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 I know that. I know that I'm not going to to do something if it's a little bit harder. It's just it maybe it's human nature, maybe it's just me. But for me to invest in digging and putting in a hydrant just for that section is worth it because it's going to get watered better. And if I have to add another hose for that time that it's watering or switch something around, it's going to make a difference. And that's not just true for workers, it's true for me too. You know, I have a lot to do and, you know, you're going to take shortcuts sometimes that maybe aren't the best. You know, so when we built the tool rack, we built two. We built one in the field, in the center, and then we built one down by the hoop houses. It's not a far distance, but it makes a big difference on whether you're going to grab the shovel to get the rock out. Right. I mean, it's it's the same idea as having a Leatherman that you carry in your pocket. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. I got one of mine, yeah. <laughs> but it's that. But it is that same idea. You know, it's it's if you if it's easy to access that tool, then you're you're more likely to do the thing that needs to be done, especially if it's a small a small item like that. Yeah, and those kind of changes, you know, are hard to calculate financially. But wherever you can see it, I try to make those changes. You know, and whether it makes sense. Does it make sense to have a clipper in every tomato house? You know. So that when you're in there and you see something, you can take care of it rather than being like, well, I got to walk all the way down to the watch station to get the tomato clip. How about fertility in your bed? Obviously, you're expecting each bed to really perform on your farm. So what are you doing for fertility, especially since you're, you're you know, after those carrots come out, you're going to come in with one, maybe even two more crops before the year's done? Well, for fertility, you know, I'm definitely not an expert in that area. And I break it down into two things. One is soil condition, and then one is nutrient balance. And so for condition is something I attack first. And that might be getting the rocks out. Um, I have really sandy soil, so I sometimes add clay, pure clay, uh, sometimes peat, uh, compost that sometimes is, uh, is it brought in, like completely composted vegetable and manure, uh, compost that we make on the farm. Um, and that's just conditioning it so that it, you can, I think you can tell when it looks nice, when it has, you know, really nice texture, crumbles the right way. And then as, when I feel the condition is right, then I'll move to balancing it, which is done just through soil tests, lots and lots of soil tests. And then starting with pH and calcium, we'll sit there with a scale, a digital scale, and weigh it out to, you know, the hundredth of a pound and do each row and make sure it's right. And then test it every year, but not add any more. Just see which direction it's going and just try to get all the, all the sections the same so that they're all balanced. Um, and that's about as technical as I get with it. And I use cheat sheets for that like I use with everything else. I don't like a lot of Excel spreadsheets or anything like that. I just have laminated cheat sheets. So I'll write down, you know, what each section will need. I have the cheat sheet, and then I can write down the, the pounds and give that to somebody to spread to make it easy for me. And how are you spreading that fertilizer then and that and the and the compost? I mean, I'm thinking those are those are both things that can be fairly labor intensive and difficult to get spread well. We don't have a tractor. Uh, what we do have is we have uh, electric cart. Um, and so the cart can go straight to the compost pile or to the amendment room, and then they just get loaded in the buckets and we spread by hand. Uh, we've changed. Our practices in the last couple of years, where now we only change, we only add compost and heavy stuff when the condition is off, and we'll just amend it, which is a lot lighter and easier to get out there. And for large sections, we'll use uh, a Gandhi spreader, uh, and things just a lot, lot faster with that. We used to put a lot more compost down, and it was just so expensive to do it that way. And I mean, you said sandy soil and you guys aren't doing cover crops. I would think that the 
the compost would be a real key part of keeping your organic matter up or building your organic matter. How's that working for you? Well, the compost really helps. We also leave a lot of the stuff in the field. Um, you know, we leave usually the roots in the field of a lot of the crops. Uh, when we cut things off, we try to leave them in the field. And we're always adding compost. We just don't do it every time we turn over or in every section. We kind of focus on where it has a problem. Where it's sandy, and I, and I don't mean sandy. I mean it's, it's sand, sand and rock. So we put a lot of effort straight up front rather than a little bit over time. A lot easier to get a whole bunch out there, you know, and then over time just adjust the amendment. And then, you know, when you flip through your Instagram feed, one of the things that's really clear is there just aren't a lot of weeds on your farm. How are you guys doing your weed control? Um, we do it all through cultivation. But it, it's incredibly important to us. It affects everything on the farm. Uh, it affects harvesting. It affects uh, how big your beets are, how big your carrots are, and so it's 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 easy to calculate. Okay, I'm getting you know fifty bunches of carrots in half an hour. How much am I making? But when you're paying someone to cultivate, it's hard to calculate because it's spread over everything. It increases the efficiency of everything, and so it's become incredibly important. And so I don't like any weeds at all. Um, and we, so I spend a lot of time training people on how to cultivate. And uh, we cultivate with hand tools. And there's different systems for different types of vegetables on how to do it quickly. But we do it very early. We do it very often. And hopefully by the end of July and August that it's gone down a bit because we need more time to harvest. But it's always been something that's been very important. We use a flame weeder, but because we're in production so often, it's not used all that often. You know, I don't, I don't leave beds for a long time. You know, I know people will put parts down, but that four weeks to me is production time. I, I don't want to be doing that. So we do more cultivating than we would do a flame weeder. It would be more pre-emergent, or maybe just after we harvested something to kind of save time on pulling out little tiny weeds or something. What? What tools are you using for the cultivating? Uh, we use the collinear hoe a lot. I really like it. I like the thin one. We've been using the wheel hoe a lot, but I, I have the new spinning wheel hoe, which I like a lot more. And so we're using that now for the pads. Um, it churns up the soil better uh, rather than having people, you know, pull the wheel hoe back and forth, which is sort of... Uh, gray area, I, you know, this, this, the spinner hole, you just go straight forward and it's done. Tell me about that tool. It's, that's not something I'm familiar with. It's from TerraTrack and uh, Johnny sells it. It's got a, uh, like a hula hole, hole blade. And then it's got a spinning metal wheel that turns the soil a little bit. Uh, they have different widths, but I only use the one for the pad. Because if anything's hanging near it, it's going to turn that thing up, too. But it, it's a great tool. And then for the flame weeder, we have two. One that we bought, which is 30 inches wide, and then one that we had made by someone, which we use inside the greenhouses. And it's thinner, so we can get it around different smaller areas. Is that flame weeder on wheels, I'm imagining? Because that would make it more predictable how it's going to perform with different users using it. Yeah, the one we bought came with the wheel, and then the one we had made has uh, has uh, a wheel. It has a, a wide, nice, flat wheel that um, doesn't cause a divot, but it's, it's hard to describe. It's just a very narrow flame weeder that we made to use with the, the standard single flame weeder. We just have a hood with wheels, and so that it can be moves around really easy. And you bring the 30-inch one in a house, it's a bit much. So that's why we have the little one. And you've mentioned a couple of times that you have multiple versions of tools around. You you know, you said like you've, you know, you've got snippers in every house. You've, you've got two tool sheds stocked with tools for getting things done on your farm, even though an acre and a half, it's not that far to walk. But how are you deciding where to make those kinds of investments in your farm? Well, for like a specific tool, 
right? Because that's sometimes where it's easier to describe how you make uh, an investment, especially an extensive tool. You know, those are those are hard to make a decision. You're like, well, is it really going to save me time? Is it going to make me money? I just don't know. Like a good example was we bought in the spring, we bought the paper pot transplanter, which is an absolutely ingenious tool. And so, but we, you know, we've got to work it into our system. How do we do it? You know, um, how am I going to get workers to use it? It's expensive. It's, it's, it's like a seeder. It's easy to use, but really easy to, to use badly. You know, things get clogged, <laughs> you know, hopper is, is emptying too fast. You know, there's lots of subtlety, even though it's easy to use. And so for me, I see it, I buy it, I try to work it in the system. If it doesn't work, it ends up on the pile. But I, I will try to see if it's going to work. And I feel like those investments are really, really important. So when we've been using the paper pot transplant, it's just so fast to transplant that I'm changing my system based around it. And it's one of those tools that if I'm talking to a first-year farmer, I say, you can wait on a germination chamber. You can wait on a fancy van. You can wait on table heat in your crop house. But this is a tool you've got to get right away because you're going to do it and you're going to do it fast. And I wish I had it. <laughs> but we will always be looking for those tools, but some of them you're either past or you're not there yet. And sometimes it's that decision. It's not whether to get it or not and whether it's uh, going to work. Most tools are going to work in the right system at the right time and you're far. Right, we we know that there's certain tools we want, but we're not there yet. We're maybe two years out, and it's just not the right time yet. And there's other tools that are ending up in the barn because we've moved on, even though they're great tools, but they were at a different time and they're no longer valid. So what's a, what's an example of a tool that you know you're going to need in two years, but that doesn't fit your operation now? That's easy. Uh, the eye grow. Yeah, and what is that? Well, when we do tomatoes, we need to balance the the heat, the water, the ventilation so that we get maximum production. At the beginning, you just want to grow tomatoes. Then you want to grow more tomatoes. Then you want to make sure they're healthy. Then you want to extend the season. But right now, we're at the point where we want to extend production, the highest production possible. So I have a thermostat for everything. You know, thermostat here, thermostat there. And then I get it dialed in perfectly. It takes me a few weeks until it's perfectly dialed in. Then the season's over, we move to winter, and it's all lost. The eye grow controls all of it. So it's going to be the one, the master controller of all of your equipment so that you can save your settings. Uh, you can do fancy things like uh, you can force out the humidity. You know, it'll check humidity and then force it out and then reheat up the house again. But it's something we're not quite ready for. I was certainly weren't ready for a couple of years ago, but we feel we, we are definitely heading in that direction. And an example of a tool that you were using two years ago that you're not using now? Oh, soil blocking. You know, that was something that was, um, you don't think you're ever going to leave it, and then suddenly it goes. And um, it's a lot, most of the system in the prop house. You know, having a homemade germination chamber, using mini blocks, transferring the mini blocks into other soil blocks. We, while it is a great system, we had to throw it out once we figured out that we had something better, something that was working better for us at the time. Um, and so we no longer do it at all. And I suppose when you say it was the right system at the time, part of what made it the right system at the time was probably, I'm thinking things like low investment, um, not a lot of crop care after you get it started. You know, soil blocks, you can get away oftentimes with watering once a day, which doesn't necessarily work with cell trays. Things like that? Yeah, and it's, it's cheap. We started the first year with the hand one. You know, that's how much money we had. You know, we had to decide whether we were going to buy two hand ones or stick with one. And then we, you know, we, the big investment was moving up to the standing block. 
you know. So, you know, with very little money we started out with, so you can start with nothing. You can mix your own soil, you know, 30 bucks, you got to hand one, and you're, you're running. But it's Kate and I, so we're fast. But we're certainly not as fast as selling, you know, windscape trays. And now that we do the paper pot trays, plants, there's a whole other tray system, which we've got to work into the system. So, and, and I'm just curious, what are you guys using for potting soil? Well, we've been using a local one for years. Um, but as we move to like the paper pot transplanter, which is more delicate and needs really fine soil, we're moving to... Vermont compost in the fall. Okay. And is that based on having done some trials with that? Yeah. We definitely tried it out um, because we were kind of screening a lot of our soil. And so we tried it out and it's definitely where we want to be. So Connor, I mean, one of the things that you've, that you've talked about, it's, I feel like it's almost been a theme throughout, throughout our conversation today has been the, the impermanent nature of some of the changes that you've made on the farm. But it feels to me like, I don't know, like, you know, if, you, if things, are, things are always changing, then you never get to a situation where, where you've, you've solved a problem and moved on. Yeah, so we, we, it, it seems impermanent. But our philosophy is always a permanent solution to a problem rather than a temporary one. So, for example, flea beetles on arugula with Turner. Temporary solution is throwing some row cover over it. And I didn't want to do that. It just felt so, it felt like it was going to cause more problems than it would solve. It's constantly removing and taking off. So now we have a house, all our houses are screened. So we have everything inside the house that's going to be eaten by sea beetles. And it's a permanent solution to that problem. And it's things that we try to do across the farm. And I don't like the, you know, like I don't like mowing because mowing, <laughs> you have to keep mowing. And there's never an end to it. But I want a permanent solution to whatever that situation is. So... We're starting to put uh, crusher run paths around the field. I don't have to mow. We don't have to clip the edges again. It's permanent. So while the system is changing, we try to look for answers that are permanent. And I don't mind ripping them out if there's a better permanent solution. <laughs> we're we're going to rip out the well and we're putting in a new well. If well sounds permanent, but we didn't put in a screened well the first time. A screened well is better for our situation to our stand. And so we're ripping it out and putting another permanent well in. And I suppose this is one of the advantages of, of running a farm where you've you've got a lot of income. I mean you've got you're moving a lot of money through the place that 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 makes it a lot more possible to both put in place the permanent solution, but also not to be afraid that that permanent solution might not turn out to be permanent. Yeah, you have to have, you know, we always want to know when is it paying for itself? Because that's important because you want to get some benefit out of it before you know that you're going to have to pull it out or change it or something's going to happen. And those are sometimes hard to calculate, but um, we always try to. And even though there's money moving through the farm, the expenses go way up and we have certainly put you know we've taken business loans to put into infrastructure when we knew it was the right thing the production always grows faster than infrastructure right and so you need to build right. the infrastructure quickly so that you can catch up to it and then you know you're investing for the future yeah i absolutely agree and i think i think those kinds of infrastructure and development uh, projects are really important. And, and, and I think those are really those things that it does make sense to finance because it is something that holds its value and, and provides a return on its investment over time. You know, we made big investments, um, you know, much through the profit of the farm, but we also took out loans to make big investments that we knew would pay for themselves over the long run, you know, brand new vans for the market, uh, a good washing station, 
those kind of things that you know you must have and will. You, you cannot do the production that you have without it. Connor, before we switch over to the lightning round, you've talked a lot about employees and, and we've talked a lot about how you function with them. I'm just curious on your farm, how many employees do you guys have? Today, we have four full-time and two part-time. We don't run the farm on interns or apprentices or woofers. They're all full-time insured employees. When you say insured, they're, they've got workers' comp, or you guys go yeah, they beyond that? Comp, they're legal. Yeah, they have workers' comp, they're legal, they're paid hourly. There's no, we're, we're not paying them with vegetables. And that's in addition to yourself and Kate. Yeah, so we have two unpaid employees. <laughs> you, guys, you guys get paid in that ever-increasing value of the operation, right? That's Yeah. And that's why we want to stop expanding so we can hopefully get a little value before we expand again. So with that, Connor, I'd like to switch to our lightning round here. We've talked a lot about tools on the on your farm. What's your favorite tool on the farm? You know, my favorite tool is going to be a boring tool. It's the radio. <laughs> we use it every day, all day. Um, it saves so much time. It's, it's so cheap to buy. I don't mind replacing them. I know it's not a farm tool. It's not interesting, but it's it's absolutely my favorite tool. The and these are the two way radios that you carry on your belt, right? Yeah. So it's just a Motorola weatherproof radio. And everybody has to sign one out, whether you work in the washing station or your full time field hand. We got them in our house, so we're always talking. Where does this go? Where does that go? What do I do here? How do I label this? Um, it's, I don't know how we function without them. It's one of those tools that you just can't imagine on a daily basis how you function. You know, you can imagine transplanting without, let's say, a paper cut transplant, which is a great tool. But how did you function without communication? One of the early farms that I worked on used radios extensively. And for me, it was it was one of those things that we bought very early on in our farming career because when we started on our own, because of exactly what you said, I couldn't imagine farming without a good two-way radio. So I think it's a great a great example of a farm tool. What's your favorite crop to grow? And I'm and I'm guessing this is going to be something that's a little bit off the wall because you mentioned that you you're kind of setting some stuff aside now, or some so you're, that you're setting space aside now to to do that kind of production. Yeah, and I think I would have two answers to that. One is we've always loved growing tomatoes, and we really put a lot of investment into it. I love growing them early. I love love everything about it. But we have been getting more into that we left behind in the early days, some more rare stuff, you know, old seeds that we'll just, you know, dedicate a little section to. They probably won't sell if the restaurant doesn't buy them. I mean, they'll go to the farmer's market and then the compost, but it is bringing enjoyment into the farm, doing these sort of rare plants. So now, if I'm going to pronounce them incorrectly, but the crepidines, they're beautiful little old style beets. All right. I like that. Heirloom beets. Maybe could you tell us a little bit more about the old style beets? Well, they're supposedly the oldest known... Uh, beets that we still have seeds for. So this may be the romantic side of me, but it kind of feels like you're tasting the past. It doesn't matter whether they taste better. It's that you're tasting something that maybe when they were first developing beets and making them into the big, round, juicy, sweet things we have today, what they were tasted like. That's interesting. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, I mean, not that you're, I mean, you're still very much, I think, a beginning farmer, but if you could roll back five years and tell yourself one thing at that point, what would it be? I tell myself two things. Uh, the first thing I would tell myself is it's going to get a lot easier. The second thing would be get the paper pot transplanter and don't buy the filler. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Connor, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, I had a great time too, man.
All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 78 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Crickmore. That's C-R-I-C-K-M-O-R-E. If you value the podcast, we'd really appreciate your support. You can become a patron of the show by setting up a monthly donation through Patreon, which is kind of like Kickstarter for ongoing projects. It's a great way to support the behind the scenes effort that you don't hear from research and scheduling to editing and getting the show online. Or you can do a one-time donation through PayPal, which would also be awesome. Speaking of which, I would like to start the tractor as a shout out to a few Farmer to Farmer patrons. Dan Breezebois, Jonathan Bruderlein, and Bob Blanchard. Thanks, Dad. Plus, if you use the Amazon.com link on farmer to farmer podcastcom Amazon kicks a percentage of what you spend back to the show, and it won't cost you a penny more. Go to farmer to farmer podcastcom slash donate for more information and all of the relevant links. Thank you so much for your support. You can sign up for my email list at farmer to farmer podcastcom or purplepitchfork.com. I'd like to note that reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of our business, so if you enjoy the show, please bounce on over to iTunes or Stitcher, leave us a review, and I'd love to get your guest suggestions. This episode is a direct result of those suggestions, so please keep them coming at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Thank you for listening, be safe out there, and keep the tractor running.